Funding for Elwood City Limits is brought to you by Facebook. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. Twitter. At ECL Podcast. Tumblr. ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com. Email. ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. And by contributions from listeners like you. Literally at ElwoodCityLimits.Libson.com. Thank you. Cha-ching, cha-ching, baby. I haven't written uh, 2017 on a check just yet, but uh, like you like you were just saying off air, Lucas, it's it's bound to happen. I'm gonna make that mistake pretty soon. I mean, there's so many days left of 2018, and I still have to get used to calling it that. 2018, nothing could stop us. Will we might have had a couple weeks break, but whether it's a new year or a uh, well, what are they calling it? A bomb cyclone, cyclone bomb, whatever this big storm is. Uh, the new episode of Elwood City Limits continues. I didn't even know it had a name. Yeah, we're uh, we are on the uh, the eve of a big storm that is going to hit uh, Atlantic Canada, and uh, we're both kind uh, of and, I, and the east coast of the states. I to believe the oh. cyclone. If I'm to believe this Washington Post article, let me see if I can figure out the exact terminology. This Washington Post article is hilarious because it's pretty much the most inflammatory weather statement I've ever heard in my life. Here we go. (laughs) Bomb cyclone blasting East Coast before polar vortex uncorks tremendous cold late this week. That's a lot. Uh, That's a lot of fancy fancy terms in there. (laughs) Unforgiving cold has punished the (laughs) eastern United States. Uh, A monster ocean storm. Uh, winter hurricane battering easternmost New England. So, blinding it, snow. Is this a weather report or a SmackDown recap? The, I know, it's crazy. It's the, all this terminology. Look it up. Washington Post bomb cyclone blasting East Coast. Well, uh, well, before we get into the talk of, you know, uh, bomb cyclones and whatever, welcome, everybody, to the first edition of Elwood City Limits for the year 2018. I'm your host, Will Young. With me is my co-host, Lucas Mancini. Hello, hello. So we've been sitting on these notes for a little while, decided to uh, take a week off due to illness, and then, of course, it was Christmas and New Year's, and now we've got all the holidays and the illnesses behind us, knock on wood, and we're ready to give it to you. We've also been sitting on uh, quite a few emails as well, so I'm very eager to get to those, too. Let's do it. All right. Before the bomb cyclone hits, it wipes (laughs) us all away. All right, we gotta clear so out these emails. We got a couple of emails from Dylan from BC who wants to uh, uh, thank us for the podcast. He's been fascinated with Arthur since it was on PBS when he was a kid. Arthur on PBS and The Weekenders and Recess on the Family Channel. For you Americans, Recess and Weekenders would have been on the Disney Channel, I believe. That's right. Uh, Yeah, but the Family Channel, that was always one of like, that was kind of so, I didn't have expanded cable when I was younger. I had to like go to my grandmother's house for that. And as soon as you hit Channel 43, the Family Channel, and you got it, you knew that you were in good hands. (laughs) I I, I was never a big fan. I was more of a YTV guy. That a family channel guy. My sister loved the family channel. You know, the sweet lives of Zach and Do- Cody's, the Zoe 101s of the world. Myself, more of a fan of the YTV roster of shows like the uh, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, Fairly Odd Parents. YTV and Fox Kids were the uh, were the two that I really trucked with. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, CBC's Saturday morning uh, lineup. But I was pining for when I would be able to get Teletoon. That was That was the one I really missed out on. Uh, another one here, just a quick one from Dylan. He has a question. What is your least favorite Arthur episode in terms of plot devices and character development and or overall boringness? Uh, we don't normally talk about like, you know, because at the end of a season, we'll, you know, talk about our most favorite. But uh, I wonder if we'd be able to name our least favorite episodes so far. Jeez, I see the, my least favorite ones are usually ones that are so forgettable that I well, forget them pretty much immediately. Uh, I was thinking about, I think I came across, I was creeping the Elwood City Limits Facebook page uh, the other day, 
and I was seeing, uh, I think it was Corbin Garcia's linear edit of uh, the the episode where Pal becomes lost. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, um, I remember you kind of liked that episode, and I had like huge problems with it. I'm sure that's not my least favorite episode by a long shot, but that's definitely the only one that comes to mind. Again, my least favorite episode is probably one that I've already forgotten. Very, um, very true. The only one that comes to mind for me. And, you know, I talked about it so much was, you know, so long spanky, but just because of how uh, brazenly it it doesn't matter to the overall. uh, And that's funny because I remember not thinking that one was that bad at at all. It's it's, we both uh, kind of disliked episodes that the other person thought was pretty okay. So that's interesting. We have another email here from uh, Matt, listener Matt. Uh, Matt says, as I get older and look back at Arthur, I found that some of the main characters might not hold up as well as I remember. I've often found that some of the original main gang from the earlier seasons, like Brain, Francine, and Muffy, are at their best when they're either in an ensemble episode or have more tolerable characters to play off of. On the other hand, characters like Fern, George, and Binky work in whatever role the episode needs them to. I still enjoy plenty of episodes featuring Brain, Muffy, etc., but they tend to tend to come across uh, for uh, more one-dimensional than the rest of the cast. So an interesting observation there on characters. And we've kind of said stuff like that in previous episodes I, I, as well. I pretty much totally agree, especially with George, Fern, and Binky. Uh, the only person I probably wouldn't agree with is maybe Francine, just because I think um, a lot of the Francine solo episodes actually work fairly well, especially when they involve her family, um, just because I think Francine's family is probably my favorite of all the uh, uh, the Arthur grown-ups. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely agree when it comes to Brain and Muffy. I've been really disappointed up to this point with uh, Brain and Muffy's characterizations. Yeah, I agree with you. Matt also says, while you guys weren't the biggest fans of the Christmas special, I cannot wait for you to see the second Arthur special where they meet the Backstreet Boys. Oh, Uh, ladies and gentlemen. uh, (laughs) Well, why did we watch that one? (laughs) What's going on here? Well, because, Lucas, we 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 gotta keep them waiting. That's coming. But not right now. But trust us, I know all about that, and it will be on its way. All right, last one here is from, actually, two listeners. Uh, They write us kind of in a joint email here. Our names are Teresa and Stella. We've been friends for over 20 years. Uh, While we share many interests, Arthur has always been very near and dear to us since the show we both grew up with. Stella learned about your show from the Out of Context Arthur Tumblr, which is a great Tumblr. You should definitely check that out. Uh, Then texted me about it. We grew up in the same city, but now live in different states. We were stoked to find a podcast dedicated to one of our favorite shows. And then we get a couple of individual um, observations here. Teresa, I've been listening to you guys since almost the beginning of the year. Really enjoy the banter. Your personalities mesh well. Uh, I get a kick out of the different pop cultural references, uh, such as Parappa the Rapper, Homestar Runner, and Nintendo related, especially as they were huge parts of our childhood. But don't worry, we've got plenty more of those to spare. Seems like she might be uh, uh, very much in your wheelhouse there, Lucas. I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you've supplied many of the Nintendo references and Homestar Runner. I think the only one that's more my bag is that Parappa the Rappa. Kick punch, it's all in the mind. Uh, and Stella uh, says uh, she enjoys the depth of discussion uh, in the podcast, callbacks to uh, old PBS shows, uh, video games, professional sports. She says, as a fan of both basketball and baseball, I always get a good laugh out of Lucas's occasional NBA and MLB jokes. Let me tell you, those those Celtics. How about that Kyrie, huh? Hmm. Yeah, you you. you That's you, for them. <laughs> you see, you 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 sure said that. Uh, yeah. So Teresa and Stella, are very uh, happy to have discovered us, and we're happy that you did, uh, ladies. And thank you very much for your wonderful email. Thank you everybody for your emails. We really appreciate it. Over at Elwood City Limits at Gmail dot com. Okay, so I've been uh, these these notes have been burning a hole in my documents folder for a couple weeks now. So uh, let's. Did get... you uh, rewatch the episode? I've got the uh, I've got the episode on hand. So thankfully, okay. I try and do that these days because sometimes, it, you know, I used to I used to do it how you know I would watch the episode the same day we were recording and then uh, I would have it fresh in my mind. But I know that that's not exactly uh, convenient for us. Uh, as our schedules are. So I do the notes whenever I can, and then I bring up the episode and just kind of keep it mute so I at least 
uh, have a visual landmark of where we're going. And thank goodness, because uh, so we are talking about, first of all, uh, the the episode is called Background Blues, which I was very confused about a couple weeks ago. What exactly it was about. And boy, was I did I ever continue to be confused when this episode started? <laughs> I'll tell you. I that. guess it's 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 like their their historical background, their family background. But you could have picked a better episode, a, a, a better name, like "How I Met Your Great Great Grandfather." Right. Uh, imagine that if Arthur managed to get to that uh, narrative formula before "How I Met Your Mother," and it's just like, well, it kind of did. That's kind of what this is, right? Like the two kids sitting on the couch. That was the first thing I thought of. Well, I, I, I see it more as Arthur of the future. That's right. If you think 2018 was a futuristic sad year, let's go to the fire flood future of Arthur. Arthur's going to be right by your side till 3005, it seems. Uh, mm. Because it's not actually, it's not quite Arthur. Uh, so, okay, to, to really explain what's going on here, it's Arthur in the future. And it's, you know, almost, it's very difficult to describe every single detail, but it's kind of... Uh, Jets, a Jetsons-esque future, and the characters we're focusing on in this cold open are R4 and 3W. Which is such a good joke. That's so fu- Like, they could have just called them Future Arthur and Future DW. Right. But R4 and 3W is already, like, what a great way to start this off. I like it. I think it's I think it's kind of funny. Like, makes you think a little, but also doesn't distract from what they're doing. It's... We get some really, like, Back to the Future 2, like, future humor, which is my favorite when people make fun of the future. Like, there's a really good inflation joke. Okay, so there's a lot of references to the fact that, like, this future that we live in, which, you know, I I, I believe it's got to be the 3000s because these are Arthur's <laughs> great-grandchildren. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we've got jetpacks going on in the home, and they're not, like, fire jetpacks, like fuel. They're, like propulsion systems almost like they almost look like lasers or something uh yeah so a couple of lines here like uh mom's talking on the video phone which certainly is uh closer than we think and she says i got the kids mittens on sale for only three million (laughs) dollars which i don't know why like inflation here barty here's i for oh i forget the exact numerical about but like go get a coke uh those kind of jokes always kill me right a real Back to the Future two type stuff, as you said. That's uh, now very quaint if you ever if you watch that movie uh, post twenty fifteen. Uh, there's a there's a poster on the wall for Cyber Bunny, which is Bionic Bunny's new equivalent. Uh, so Arthur is doing his homework, except he's pressing he presses a button on his floating laptop, and it just says homework done. <laughs> so it's a homework button. Uh, and then 3W asked to play Virtual Flingy, which is uh, actually much closer than we think as well because they've both got those uh, those VR headsets on. Do you think this is uh, the Vive or the PlayStation Move? I think it might be neither. It could be the Oculus. Oh, yeah, that's true. There, there's a thing here where they're like p- playing some kind of maybe ping pong or tennis kind of game. And- Windjammers. Windjammers. <laughs> Oh, that would be awesome if they were like the, the, it, there's too much overhand for it to be wind jammers. But if they were like doing the frisbee thing of just <laughs> oh man, virtual wind jammers would be so great. Um, and three W is just like ow, watch it, you're hurting me. And Arthur's and R excuse me, R four says quit grieving. So that's their uh, future future slang. It's like uh, yeah. Uh, it's like watching a Demolition Man, and they they're calling it like murder, <laughs> death, kill, and stuff like that. If this is the future, where's all the laser guns? <laughs> they kind of get into a little bit of an argument, and then Mom comes in and says, "All right, you two, I want you to sit on the Barkazoid and watch a datagram, which is the couch and a video." <laughs> the, so a datagram, I understand, like it's it's definitely a lot. Uh, wordier than, say, Blu-ray or DVD. Though the Barkazoid is something I don't quite understand. You know what, though? Like, has technology names ever made sense? Like, what's a Nintendo Wii? You know what I mean? I'm sure some Fortune 500 angel investor Silicon Valley company would come up with something called a Barkazoid. Yeah, I'm sure Elon Musk has got uh, his fingers Elon on Musk, all yeah. Uh, So, okay, yeah, fair, good point. If, you know what? Uh, if you're listening to this in the year 3000, what are couches named 
and uh, <laughs> and uh, how, how's my family doing? Just uh, check in on them, would you? Uh, so what were the lottery numbers? Please get in touch. <laughs> um, so we've got um, that. That is that is the cold open. It's definitely uh, I, I st- strange, unusual. Maybe it's it's creative. I appreciate that they kind of didn't do what you expected them to do. I'll tell you what. It gets even weirder once we get to the ending of the second episode. In this uh, two episode pairing. Okay. The fact that both of these episodes are sort of framed by looking back from the future right. is kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, so the episode really starts with Mr. Ratburn giving his class a uh, family tree kind of assignment, and we also get a, again another kind of creative part of this episode is. Uh, he, him kind of tracing his family tree, and everybody Which kind of the uh, the rapper and genealogy. They must have really gotten around the globe in their day, because we we kind of go from Egypt to to France to all sorts of places. Yeah, the rapper and family tree is really full of a lot of uh, go getters and leaders. So <laughs> it's this kind of flashback of like Ratburns leading uh, the third grade class throughout history. Like first, it's uh, in France during I'm get what I'm guessing is World War One. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Valiant oh, Valiant Hearts. I thought if you played of, that game. I thought it was like the uh, the French Revolution, like Napoleon. Yeah, you know what? That's probably that's probably right around them. It, I just kind of got I got a I kind of got uh, Valiant Hearts in my head, but I think you're right, Lucas. And and it keeps like going on in their different uh, languages. So in in French, he says work harder. Then it flashes back to Greece and their. Uh, chiseling a statue and he says work harder and then finally <laughs> it's them building the pyramids and an egyptian rat burn since <laughs> since they don't know what egyptian sounds like he just talks in visible hieroglyphics like a word a word bubble just comes up which, very creative which is a, which is a, which is kind of a funny way to dodge around the fact that we're not a wouldn't be a hundred percent as to like there's no cartoon shorthand for like egyptian language hmm uh, so yeah, they've got this family tree assignment, uh, that they want to, that he's got the kids doing. And one of the main kind of themes of it is that a lot of the kids think that their families have done like exceptionally cool stuff. So Francine has a little bit of an imagination of her own that maybe she, uh, discovered the, what was it? The Pacific ocean or something. Oh no, it, it's I forget what it's called. It's like the Northwest Passage. It's 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 the thing that Lewis and Clark did. Right. And then essentially you know, Muffy says the same thing of just like sorry Francine, but Lewis and Clark already did that. And it's just like, okay, maybe she helped them. And it's this uh uh it's this cutaway of Lewis and Clark going down a lake and they're about to they're about to dock like by some mountains and then a bear comes upon them and then all of a sudden A non a no, I I must stress this, a non sentient bear Absolutely. You, you, we have to do it at this point. So a non-sentient bear is about to attack them, but then Ma Frensky comes out of nowhere, and it's basically an older version of Francine with, like, an 1800s bonnet and apron and dress, and she wrestles the bear to the ground and pins him for a 10 count, and <laughs> she even has, like, a corn cob pipe. I got to tell you, I love Ma Frensky. Like, she only shows up for this, like, minute-long interlude here. But I I kind of wish she was a character herself. I got a real big kick out of Ma Frensky. Not since Daniel Bryan has we have we seen such human versus bear uh, contests of strength take place. And, and, and uh, Francine's voice actor plays her with, like, a, like a drawl. So she's just like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I win. <laughs> So it's it, very, very endearing, and uh, I really made it stick out of my memory. So that's kind of where everybody's going, and, like, Muffy believes that her uh, family is, you know, royalty or some such, and just having these lofty expectations for uh, wh- what her what she, what she thinks her family is versus what they actually turn out to be. We get a funny cutaway, so, of, like, Buster talking to Bitsy at the dinner table, and he says... Grandpa was a toll booth operator? Wow. <laughs> Speaking of someone who is a toll booth operator, it's not really a wow kind of profession. There's that one... Let me try and think of some famous toll booth operators throughout history. There's I... that scene in The Godfather where they kill Sonny at the toll booth. That's it... pretty crazy. Yeah, see, that would be me. I'd be the guy ducking under the toll booth <laughs> to not get shot. <laughs> 
Although most of them that I work at do have bulletproof glass, so I should be fine. If a, if yeah. any mob hits happen, I'll <laughs> report back here and let you know. Arthur finds out that his grandfather owned a cheese shop, which is actually pretty cool. I, I would love one of my family to own a cheese shop. Uh, uh, my question is, where, what kind of like bad business did Arthur's grandfather <laughs> get into that his cheese fortune suddenly disappeared? Yeah, because there's no like Dave Reed didn't inherit the uh, the cheese the cheese fortune or anything like that. And cheese is like gold, man. People are always buying cheese. Like cheese never goes out of style, so something must have happened. That's absolutely true. Uh, and that, like I said, I would love to get some discounts on cheese. Are you kidding me? At this point, this is what I started to realize that this is one of those episodes that's a very time and place thing, and that Ancestry.com sort of would negate this episode's existence. <laughs> right. All these kids would have to just send their DNA away, and they wouldn't have to do any kind of on the ground research. Right, because Arthur finds out about his grandfather by looking at old newspaper photos in the library, which, again, uh, Arthur very much uh, a li library propag – pro-library propaganda. Uh, and then they meet Muffy in there, and I, lo and I just love uh, Muffy thinking that her family was, like, royalty of or something. And yeah, yeah. And she, uh, I wrote down the line. She yeah. goes, this is a library. You're supposed to have books on important people. Because because she she asked she asked Arthur and Buster, uh, can you point me to the crosswire section? And they're both like, <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, never mind. I'll just find it. I'll just ask Miss Turner. And you're right. So this is a library. You're supposed to have stuff on important people. So yeah, that was that was really funny. Uh, Francine's also looking up old uh, newspapers as well, and she's kind of so. I just made I just made this little note, and again, this is kind of a, again a time and place thing. Like Francine comes up with what is clearly an older newspaper, uh, talking about her grandfather, but she's just kind of handling it with her hands. And I'm like, Francine, the oils in your fingers and that old newspaper, like they aren't gonna mix. Like if if anything, it might even crumble. Yeah, they don't have one of those like giant machines where you kind of bring up the newspaper slides. Well, they do actually, because Arthur was using that. Oh, so Francine's just like ripping it willy nilly, like she's trying to solve the uh, the Chinatown mystery. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just so kids, be 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 careful with old newspapers, please. Muffy goes back to her parents, and her mother says that the Crosswires weren't royalty or anything; they were just plain folks. And she, Muffy, just like mother, how can you say such a thing? Uh, she's got some fantastic reactions here. Uh, her father suggests that she visit her great aunt Olga Crum. What a name. That's like that's like Grimslid. That's another like <laughs> that's another like so old school it's new. Olga Crum. That's the, Olga Crum. Uh it's very like uh uh Eastern Bloc Europe though. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of some of my family names except uh I've ne I don't believe that there is an Olga Crum in my mother's side of the family. Although I'll have to ask. There is there is a funny cutaway. Uh so the next day uh, Arthur, Buster, Francine talking about the project. Buster's got this lunchbox from his grandfather uh, that he hasn't been able to open yet, and he really wants to know what's inside. Uh, See, mo more on that later. I, I don't know why I wrote this down because it was so long since I wrote these notes. Yeah. Uh, but I wrote down for some reason, I wonder if Buster's lunchbox has Nazi gold in it, <laughs> and I don't know why I wrote that down. Um... <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna say. Uh, I'm not saying that Buster's grandfather's a Nazi. He could have stolen the Nazi gold, but for some reason, that was a question that had popped into my head. Well, I mean, hey, <laughs> he hasn't gotten it open yet, but uh, we're gonna have. Uh, he's gonna have to wait and see. Hmm. Yeah, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Is it Nazi gold? <laughs> what is it? I'm trying to even think what that's a reference to. That's like. Uh, let's see. I think uh, the. The girl with the dragon tattoos got some Nazi gold in it. Well, um, there's that episode of The Simpsons where they get where uh, Abe Simpson and the flying hellfish got all of those like paintings and stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, there's that uh, in the inside, inside man. I think they're trying to get Nazi gold from that bag. It's definitely it's definitely uh, a trope in those kinds of things. <laughs> like Nazi gold. Is okay. Just I, I'm glad it's not just something that like popped into my brain. I'm <laughs> like, why did I write this? I don't. I, I don't think it's just you, pal. Uh, so Muffy has uh, ideas that her great aunt Olga Crum has got to be a queen, which would make Muffy a princess. We get this dream sequence of Muffy meeting her 
uh, her great aunt Olga Crumb, and we even get a little. Uh, this this is a timely reference for uh, movies in 1998. She says, "Is that you, Anastasia?" Which the yes. which the Anastasia animated movie would have either been out by now or coming out very soon. Me and Emily, uh, my girlfriend, were just talking about Anastasia and uh, how like. It's so weird to think back about how someone made a Disney movie for children about, like, the assassination of the Romanoff family. Because if you, like, read the actual story of what really happened, it's pretty gruesome. It, I, I watched that a few years ago with my with my fiancé because she... Uh, I, I don't know if she still loves Anastasia, but I think she believed that she did. And it's just like, yeah, exactly. We had the same reaction of, like, this is weird... It's like <laughs> taking all the politics away from the assassination of the Romanovs and then blaming it on Rasputin, who wasn't alive at the time and is a wizard. Like, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's really it's, strange for such a like a complicated <laughs> uh, historical event uh, on like sociopolitical levels, economic levels, like uh, to be boiled down to like. A movie a la Beauty and the Beast is just really... Uh, it's crazy that it got made in the first place. Yeah, and you could never, ever do this <laughs> in this day and age. Do you want to start a revolution? <laughs> we'll kill the family in their house. Well, their names are already kind of like Germanic, Slavic. It's Anna and Elsa, so like... Oh my goodness. We're halfway there as it is. <laughs> Frozen 3, Olaf discovers the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Oh man, what's that, what's that red literature that he's got? Oh no! <laughs> Mark's Olaf. <laughs> hey... Hey, better than that other frozen thing they did last year. Hmm. Uh, so and if, and it and Muffy also says in the uh, in the dream sequence of just like so I'm actually the long lost princess of Translatvia. Cool. Now Translatvia is is a new one for me. Yeah, isn't that like Doctor Doom's country? No, that's uh, that that's close. It's Latveria. Ah, uh, I see. Translatvia, uh, by a quick Google search, does not exist. However, <laughs> however, it does point. You don't say. It does point me to the Shadow Run uh, wiki. Ooh. Uh, apparently, there's a corporation in Shadow Run called Translatvia. So maybe. Oh what if that was a reference? Was Shadow Run around when Arthur was around? Oh yeah, for sure. Shadow Run's old because it, it was a pen and paper RPG before it was like a video game. Did, so did somebody sneak in a Shadow Run <laughs> reference into Arthur? Oh my goodness gracious. Next, Arthur's going to be like, yeah, so there's this magic tree. <laughs> I, I, I confess, I don't know anything about Shadowrun. Uh, so. It, you know that movie Bright? That really bad movie? <laughs> I, I'm aware of it, yes. What if it was good and cyberpunk? Oh, okay. That's what Shadowrun is. I, I, and, I, I, and there's a magic tree, I think. Okay, I might be into that. It turns out that Great Aunt Olga Crumb is not a queen, and Muffy is not a princess. She finds her on, like, this kind of uh, quaint old person house is what is what I'll call it. Like, a real <laughs> like it's got, like, a, a cow print mailbox and a whole bunch of lawn gnomes. And Olga Crumb says that uh, uh, the Crosswires used to sell used horses, and then it was used carts, and then it was used cars. So at least they come by this line of work honestly. I also love the idea of a used horse as if like <laughs> I didn't like when you think about it that doesn't make any sense. That's that's a... all horses are in some way used. That's a... Unless you like raised it yourself, I guess. That's a, that is a, that is a great point and I did not think of that a used horse. Yeah, and then gives her uh, a little gnome named Juniper for her uh, presentation. Uh meanwhile, Francine's kind of having troubles of her own because she said to Muffy that uh you know, her grandfather used to own a castle when they met at the library, but it turns out she was only half right. Uh he used to be the manager of the Hamburger Castle, which is an Elwood City restaurant. More than a manager, he would have been a franchisee. Right. Which is, uh, again, talk about s some people in the uh, Elwood City crew's uh, great-grandparents have not been the smartest financially. Whether it's a cheese store or a fast food franchise, I'm to believe owning a fran fast food franchise, you're basically set for life. Like if you have a, a McDonald's or this situation, I assume it's like a White Castle, basically. Uh, I... I I, from what I've heard, it's very lucrative. 
uh, I mean, hey, sure. It, and people still know what it is, uh, even though he's not currently the owner of it. So, and, and Francine's kind of a little bit ashamed of that, but I think owning a hamburger castle would be pretty cool. Like, I don't, oh, yeah, I don't see sure. the problem here. Uh, well, uh, same with the other thing. I mean, eventually we learn that uh, one of uh, Francine's relatives cut Abraham Lincoln's beard one time, er, uh, and, which and, is a crazy story, which is like a, a nuts, like very interesting thing. So the fact that Francine has such high expectations and that doesn't meet it is is... I mean, it makes sense for the plot. It's We're kind of nitpicking here, but it is nuts to me that, like, if I knew someone and they were like, yeah, my uh, ancestor cut Abraham Lincoln's beard, I'd be like, that is crazy. That's awesome. Well, it wasn't even that direct. It was that uh, Francine's uh, ancestor, whose name was Vingo Frensky, which I think is great, uh, advised him to cut his beard. So he didn't even That's actually trim it. That's still fun. Yeah, no, that is still a great story. Um, and in fact, the Francine brings that up, uh, at the sugar bowl the next day. She's trying to, you know, make the Frensky seem more exciting as, as is her words. Um, Buffy is also trying to hide the fact that the crosswires are just plain folk. And she, there's a great line here where she says the crosswires owned all of England and France too, but they sold that <laughs> to the Germans. This is a good one Which for is, any that is a history very good line. Uh, and so they kind of keep going back and forth with, like, inflated claims of their own families. Uh, Francine says, a Frensky advised Lincoln. And then Muffy said, so? Lincoln was my second cousin. <laughs> so we're really getting into the out-and-out -out lies right now. Although <laughs> Muffy does some self-sabotage here. Uh, uh, when Buster, uh, I forget what Buster says to lead into this, but Muffy responds to it by saying, oh, please, Buster, that makes everything that I said sound believable. Which I did write down that Muffy snitching on herself is kind of a really clunky resolution. Like, it had to happen. There had to be some way for Muffy's lie to get blown up so Francine could sort of have her internal conflict later on in the episode. Yeah. But this one moment well, was like, who would do that, right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very unbelievable, but also kind of funny. Like, I, I wrote that down yes. because I think it is uh, kind, of, kind of silly, but in, in a fun way. You know what? For as critical as we've been of Buffy, like all throughout this entire show, I love. I think Buffy's at her best the more cartoony you make her, because I they're obviously not going to put some effort into like really fleshing her out, making her three dimensional. So you might as well go all the way with it. And I think Buff Buffy's characterization in this episode is perfect. Yeah, I think I agree with that too. Uh, I I must say, uh, uh, the next scene is Francine. She's been looking at a picture of her grandfather at the Hamburger Castle and, like, ends up snipping it in half to make it seem which like I was it is like, real castle. Which gave me a literal I, a literal gasp and a no from me. Like, could you imagine? I, I, maybe it's because, like, physical photos are such a, like, a quaint thing these days. But if you had a black and white photo of your great-great-grandfather who owned a fast food franchise and you cut it, that'd be insane! I think at least the good thing is is that you could still tape it or, or glue it back together. But yeah, totally. I, you got to be careful with that stuff. That's like a family heirloom. I was like, no, don't cut the photo. No, I would never dream of doing that. Can you? If you were found out, can you imagine? I know. It's like, uh, yeah, that was just that blew my mind. The disregard for the past. Uh, add to that the fact that uh, uh, Francine's grandpa is has such a has such a sweet old man voice like i was looking i was looking up at the imdb on this episode i was trying to find his voice actor i don't think i was able to but he's so he's so warm and gentle he's just like hiya frankie here's some more pictures of the hamburger castle <laughs> yeah. this is like oh i love this grandpa you're right the frensky family is just fil filled with a bunch of winners um <laughs> So the next day is the presentations. Uh, Muffy actually commissions a documentary to be made about her uh, her family uh, to kind uh, of narrated by Wolf Blitzen. Wolf Blitzen, har har har. <laughs> Crazy to think about how Wolf Blitzer is still around. Uh, you know, decades into the news business. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I guess today it would be like it would it would be post New Year's Eve drunk Don Lemon uh, <laughs> narrating Muff uh, Fred's, uh, Muffy's presentation feel like I you know I don't have enough time for myself these days I, 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 I my work life balance it's all out of whack and uh, <laughs> the crosswires they're important people 
<laughs> I want uh, I want Stephen A. Smith to uh, narrate uh, Muffy's documentary. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something about the crosswires. I, I, I've been living in Elwood City for 48 years, and the crosswire family are running it into the ground. <laughs> Mr. Crosswire's first act <laughs> was to sign Lamar Odom, who was on crack. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's not related, but I just love that line. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so Muffy has this documentary, and that's kind of the end of that. But uh, Francine is is in the middle of a presentation where she's going to, you know, uh, inflate the fact she says she calls her grandpa an advisor to Abraham Lincoln, uh, and you know, but it se- makes it seem more official and you know, blown up than it really is. But then her grandfather comes in because he wanted to make sure that she uh, took the photo album of his pictures of the hamburger castle with her. And while he's there, she can't bring herself to, uh, to lie about it. So she does tell the truth that her grandfather did own a castle, a hamburger castle, but all of the kids know what that is. Like it's still a restaurant in Elwood city. And, uh, uh, still think that's really cool. As do I, I think the hamburger castle is, it would be awesome to own. And she does admit that that Vingo only uh, advised Lincoln to trim his beard, but they do have beard trimmings of Abraham Lincoln, which what? yeah, which is like what you you you're only telling us about this now. Yeah, I mean, like if if we had the technology, you could clone Lincoln. That's right. We we have these beard trimmings. They were in sap for some reason, and I forget who says it. It might have been Buster, but somebody has the line, real president hairs? <laughs> uh, so he, she gets a thumbs up from her grandfather. All's well with her and Muffy. Uh, the the um, the episode kind of ends with Buster finally being able to open his grandfather's lunchbox, and there's a 40-year-old sandwich in there, and of course he eats it, and it's apparently a bologna sandwich. Yeah, it's a sandwich from like 1955, yeah. and everybody's like sort of disgusted. And then again, uh, I guess, hey, I can't tell what's worse—an old sandwich or Nazi gold. Uh, maybe he hid the Nazi gold in the sandwich. In the sandwich, oh my goodness! Buster needs to see a doctor. Maybe it's a, maybe it's it may not be Nazi gold, but maybe it was a Nazi sandwich. 1955. <laughs> did they find that sandwich in Brazil? Mm. <laughs> Uh, and then we go back to the framing device of R4 and 3W, who are just kind of confused as to uh, why everything was the way it was back then. And I mean, hey. And then we get we get some sick science remix of the Arthur music, which is also fun. Yeah, we get with all kinds of beeps and bloops in there. And we see Mr. Haney walking his robo dog or Mr. Haney's ans- uh, great great grandson, I guess. Uh, yeah. And that's the end of that episode. And now a word from us kids. So in a similar vein to their uh, project, these kids are like doing posters of members of their family, which I thought was kind of cute. And there's not this is one of the ones where there's not a lot to this one. It's kind of uh, the editing team kind of takes their posters and does like kind of most Terry Gilliam animation with it, where it's like you half expect like the Mona Lisa to like crush it with her foot and then wink and then like fart like an Amani Python transition or something like that's what these always remind me of is like a very Terry Gilliam yeah that's a good point I always forget about that but you're you're totally right it's the same kind of idea uh the one story that kind of stuck out to me is that one of the kids talks about how her aunt uh was playing basketball when she was younger and then got her front teeth caught on the basketball net yeah, she biting that hoop. You know what I'm saying? When you when when you come down so hard, you're biting the hoop like ah. You know what I'm saying? She she putting out work in the paint. But she, man, can you can you imagine like what happened? Did she lose those teeth? Like what are we talking here? I can I can only assume. Uh, and but and e- either way, still kind of a, kind of a neat idea, but not necessarily one of the more memorable. And now word the one that's guys. that stood out to me was Stephen, the dad who likes pizza. Oh yeah. Um, Stephen seems like a pretty chill dude. I mean, hey, uh, any guy who likes pizza, any dad who likes pizza is okay in my book. I'll, I'll tell you what, I did really want to know more about Stephen because like the <laughs> picture they show isn't the best. But I feel like there's a lot going on in that picture of, like, Steven kind of reclining. Like, it looks like he's in, like, a man cave or something, and it's very hard to see. It's, like, an old 90s photograph, but it's like, man, I want to know more about Steven and, and 
that he likes pizza. For sure. And now, back to Walter. Speaking of that very segment we talked about. Uh, oh, my gosh. All right. Did you know this episode was coming, Will? I did in a very general sense. And, like, once I saw the name, once I saw the title of the episode, I was like, oh, I know exactly what this is. But- I did not know this episode existed. And let me tell you, I don't think I was emotionally prepared. No, in terms of the things that we got in this episode, I don't think I was ready for that. So this one is called, and now let's talk to some kids. The this e- yeah this episode, like for the purposes of this show, this might be one of the most interesting episodes we ever talk about because it answers so many questions that we've had. Like I have expected an episode to come along that like explains the animal hierarchy. That's the level of like specific questions we've asked on this show like in the first season getting answered here it's nuts yeah this is uh i think this might be like as meta as arthur has gotten so far because it's like it's a meta commentary that is the length of the entire episode (laughs) it's a it's 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 a so to speak feature length meta commentary which hey i'm all for it i love when arthur gets meta um the opening uh, part of this episode is Arthur talking about how everybody's personalities fits them really well. You know, Mr. Ratburn likes, uh, you know, schoolwork. Buster likes jokes. Muffy is very um, rich and snooty and all that kind of thing. And then kind of uh, uh, switches their personalities around to kind of give us a little bit of a contrast. So I named the three combinations that we get here. So first off, we get Mr. Ratburn with Buster's mannerisms. So I call them Rat Buster. <laughs> uh, so he's kind of like like sits on his desk and asks everybody to think of a joke for homework which I thought was it, it, it was funny seeing Buster's voice coming out of Mr. Ratburn's body and like him adopting and him a, like a, sitting a, yes he sits on the desk yeah just kind of adopting the more kid like uh, physicality uh, we get Muff, uh, Binky with Muffy's voice so I said Muffkey or or Buffy. Yeah. Oh, ooh, I like ooh. I, I like Buffy better. Uh Muffkey is a little bit uh, a little bit awkward. Uh yeah, so Buffy and so just kind of doing like the like oh you are so rude. They have the cutest <laughs> little shoes. So kind of a funny visual. And then the last one is uh Pal with Mr. Ratburn's voice. So of course I called him Mr. Pal. Like something out of Mars attacks. Yeah, a little bit because he just kind of sits like Arthur is like daydreaming doing his homework and then pal sits up and goes arthur and it, <laughs> arthur's like Wah! so talking about it now though this this intro doesn't really have a lot to do with the episode now that i think about it yeah i, su- uh, I suppose not it's very tangential but all the same i, I did kind of get a kick out of the different combinations like uh mr pal saying when you're done with your homework i want you to scratch me behind the ears <laughs> we also get arthur delivering like inspirational almost like cushion wisdom uh inspirational tweet level knowledge like uh it's so much better when people act like themselves which is arthur's essentially his way of going yo you got to be a real one you know what i'm saying (laughs) i'm so done with fake people arthur arthur playing the role of dj khaled here exactly don't play yourself so, they don't want you to win. <laughs> so the episode itself starts with, speaking of Terry Gilliam animation, we get uh, <laughs> a a kid's show in the Arthur universe called The Magic Toolbox, which they're watching at Arthur's house. And, of course, har har, it's supposed to sound like the magic school bus. But it's what it, what it seems to be is an educational program with kind of still shots of different uh, uh, tools that are uh, – alive and go on adventures i guess i mean that's a, that like bob the builder was post this but it's pretty close handy mandy yeah handy manny handy manny he's got his his tools talk i think okay anyway the magic tool boss uh, toolbox uh i do love this idea for a show it's very it's very meta and and uh you could tell at the time this would be one of those shows where, like, it wouldn't be animated. It'd be, like, a big set, like Pee-wee's Playhouse. At least that's what I would like. Well, it, do- it does look animated within the show, but then again, once we get into that level of things, it's hard to tell. And the Magic Toolbox does have its own segment called And Now Let's Talk to Some Kids. And then, oh, my th- gosh. Man, this is the meat of the episode. Th- this is great. If- I feel like this is the Arthur writers. You know, they've been through two seasons of uh, And Now Word From Us Kids, and they're ready to, like, 
low key, not not low key, just burn the, burn these kids. Because or or not even necessarily burning them, but maybe like addressing some criticism. Like I feel like they were talking to us. Like the way I interpreted it, it's like we've been making fun of. Like we try to be nice to the kids in a word from us kids, yeah. but sometimes they can be a little awkward or stilted. And I felt like this is the Arthur writer's way of speaking to me and you, Will Young and Lucas Mancini directly, and being like, <laughs> "Hey, there's a reason these kids aren't comfortable in front of the camera." Yeah, just kind of like, "Hey, we get it." Uh, yeah, it, it, I the second it was like, let's talk to kids. I wish there was a camera on my like eyes as they widened when I was like, oh, this is what we're doing, huh? Yeah, because the kids that they interview are just like, you know, gravity is really important. Like gravity <laughs> is what makes an apple fall on your head. Uh, <laughs> you know, very much playing up the stilted nature of these types of things, like you said. And Arthur wonders, there's a line where Arthur's like, how do they pick the kids for these? And Buster's like, don't know, maybe, maybe they know the creators or something. Yeah, they just pick people who work on the show. Yeah. Which is like, if someone like recorded a conversation me and you had and put it in an Arthur episode. I mean, and it's Arthur and Buster, which are our co closest analogs, I feel. Oh my goodness. Uh, this is... <laughs> Talk about parting the kimono. <laughs> DW, speaking of burning somebody, DW gets a real burn here on Arthur. She says, what would you have to say if the, if you were on that? My name's Arthur, and my dog's <laughs> name is Pal, and blah de blah de blah <laughs> And she's even got like the the circles over her eyes for his glasses, and then is and then she's like, and here's the audience at home. And she starts snoring, and Buster <laughs> Buster's kind of laughing. Arthur looks at him. He's like, I always think snoring is funny. So there you go. That's a way to make Buster laugh, guaranteed. Next day at school, we get another one of these. <laughs> Uh, something I've come to love is the contrast between how hard Mr. Ratburn's class is and how easy the other classes are. We get introduced to one of my new favorite background characters, <laughs> Kenny. Is that his name? Yes, Kenny is his name. Oh, that's his name. So th this is the same kid, at least visually. She, she says, because I, I this is the first time he's given a name because she, she calls on him. She says, Kenny... Right, so the voice is a little bit different, but this is the Mrs. Fink kid. <laughs> so, like, go back, go back to one of the to the second episode of Elbit City Limits. We talk all about this kid, and man, I got some words for him. In contrast, so uh, Mr. Appern's class has a geography quiz that he, they have to label all of the countries in the entire world. <laughs> on like, on like, a, and, and and as always, spelling counts. I would brick this quiz. I am. I don't so, think there's. I'm so bad at geography. Like, unless you're like Rain Man or something, I feel like there's no way not to brick it. <laughs> like, there's some countries. I remember. Uh, again, we were talking about the Romanov family with my girlfriend, and then we were like talking about Eastern Bloc countries. And I just like looked up a list of countries in the Eastern Bloc, and I was like, oh, there's at least five countries in this list I've never seen the name of before. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you only have so much room if you're going to be printing all of the names. Like they like the the paper would have to be a lot bigger. All I'm saying is is that I'm glad I'm not doing this in school anymore. Uh, by contrast, Mrs. Fink's class, uh, like she says, she calls on Kenny and she says, as she's got a globe in her hand, she says, "What planet is this?" And he goes, and I sh and I swear to you, this is true. He's got to think about it for he, a second. He says, "Um, Earth." Like he's like he's afraid that he that he's got it wrong. And then she says, "It's correct." <laughs> Cookies for everyone. I'm like, oh, these kids. These kids are soft. It's like if Will Smith in Independence Day was asking a question instead of making a statement. Welcome to Earth. Oh, it just it it boils my. It would normally boil my blood, but this actually plays into the episode. Mr. Haney comes into the class, uh, interrupting the quiz, and says that the TV show Magic Toolbox is going to be recording at their school. And because Mr. Ratburn's class is the hardest working in, in the third grade, they get to be on there. So finally, they get their dues for, no, I mean, they they get immediate dues for being so hardworking. I've said before that, like, this level of work is going to pay off for them later in life. But now they finally get, like, a reward for being so hardworking. That's great. I love it. I mean, they're also going to get rewarded long term when Kenny is, like, failing the SATs. Well, yeah, but it depending depending on how <laughs> because the public education system failed him. Yeah, but depending on how malicious. What I'm saying is, it's not Kenny's fault. No, definitely not. But depending on how malicious you are, you may you know that may work for you. It may not. 
Uh, so, of course, everybody's looking forward to being on TV, but they're not exactly sure what it's going to entail. They have their own ideas of uh, what what's going to happen to them. Like, Francine imagines that she's going to be so magnetic on camera that they're going to uh, re- retool the show and make her the main character. And it's just this quick little thing of Francine coming out in, like, a screw costume and then just, like... Uh, the new star of the Magic Toolbox, Francine Ferensky. I thought this was really realistic how, like, high the kids' expectations were for being on TV. Like, we kind of, it's it does the group episode thing where we see what everybody's expectations are, and they're all very lofty. Like, uh, but it makes sense. Like, what I, I, the closest thing I to experiencing this is when I was a kid when the local television news came to our school to uh, shoot a story on the Beyblade phenomenon. And (laughs) the loudspeaker was like, everybody with Beyblades to the gym. And, like, everybody played Beyblades against each other while the the film crews filmed them. And it's like, as a kid, your idea of, like, I'm going to be on TV, this is crazy. And your mind just sort of gets away from you. Did you have a a Beyblade? Were you on TV? You know what? I was – it was the equivalent of Kenny – I, it was the one day I did not pr- remember to bring my Beyblade. Oh, dude, come on. I know. And I had the Beyblade Arena, too. I was one of the only kids with the Beyblade Arena. So people would be like, oh, Lucas, can we play Beyblades? So you're, it was – it's one of my great regrets. I had a Beyblade Arena, but I got it too late. Like, I had already wrecked my Beyblades by playing on, like, the pavement. <laughs> but I did have – I did get that sweet, like – so there's the normal – Beyblade launcher that you kind of have to do the little bit of the claw grip on. I got the one the one that always got stuck. Yeah, I got the one that has like the side grip. It's almost like a joystick sort of thing, and it's oh yeah. And so it, and as the show told me, it gave you better grip, so that you it gave you better grip for your rip. Yeah, let it rip indeed. So I was very very excited about that. I was big into Beyblade. Man, does that not hold up like at all? Beyblade, yeah. Beyblade is awful. <laughs> like uh, the top, oh, the top, say? the tops themselves are fun, but like the show, forget about it. Better or worse than Battle Beatemon? Never, never trucked with Battle Beatemon. Never, <laughs> never played it. Never saw the show. That that was after my time. Sue Ellen's idea of well, like you said, uh, everybody kind of has their own ideas of what's going to happen because they don't have a uh, they don't have a what what's the word. Uh, they don't have any, like, grounding for what exactly is going to happen. So, like, Sue Ellen thinks she'll be able to do a martial arts demonstration, which is actually pretty <laughs> cool. It's like a cutaway of her doing, like, floor work with, like, a uh, like a Donatello pole and then, like, doing some doing some real stuff. It's pretty cool. It's like her audition for the raid or something. <laughs> yeah, she's practicing her pumse. Um Well, I mean, they could have just expected what is on the show prior. I don't think they've, like... As like from what I've seen um, on the Magic Toolbox, it just seems like there's these interview segments, right? So I I mean I guess they do have a little bit of an idea of what's going on, but I also suppose but their imaginations are running wild. So Arthur thinks that he'll be able to do like a big uh, concert, a piano concert within the Magic Toolbox. So everybody's got their own idea. Everybody wants their five seconds of fame. Uh, Buster uh, Arthur because of this is practicing his. Uh, scales while Buster is practicing out jokes at Arthur's house and then DW kind of interrupts him and speaking of meta like we've got layers and layers of this stuff uh you know Buster says if I get on TV you can be with with me DW DW has a quick imagination of what that would be like and she imagines the opening of Arthur so like like see like shot for shot it's DW you know at the end of the opening to Arthur where she looks at the TV but instead of Arthur the Arthur logo instead says Buster. It's it's the same thing except it's a different color and Buster's in the same place. And so she says, hey! And then Buster falls out of the TV and he's tiny. And DW says, I knew it. I knew there were all, little people in the TV. This is... I just... This is... I, this is... Wo- this is whoa. Yeah, this this is like... If, if Maya were here, she'd say this cutaway is like whoa. <laughs> this is like the Metal Gear Solid 2 of Arthur episodes. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're in a simulation within a simulation. Lucas, don't you think it's time to turn the TV off? <laughs> don't you remember? Will, do you know what day this is? This is the day we met. 
It's the day we met, April, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness just, gracious! Just, just watch out if Arthur if Arthur gets an eye patch and starts talking about memes and jeans, we've gone too far. <laughs> That's right. We're gonna fight brain on top of the uh, George Washington monument. So- solid brain over there. The next day, everybody's kind of got their thing and are practicing. We get a little uh, little drive-by poetry reading of Fern. She's reading Casey at the Bat with the classic line, there is no joy in Mudville. So just wanted to get that out there. Uh, the main conflict of this episode is that so everybody has a thing that they're practicing with, but Brain seems very unaffected by it all. He doesn't have a thing necessarily, and he also doesn't seem very concerned about being on television. In fact, he... Uh, couldn't really care less. Uh, he said he says as much to them. Brain kind of says that to them, walks away, and then Francine says, "Well, what would he, what would that guy do on TV anyway?" Think. Oh my goodness. And I, I, and again, flashing back to the opening of Arthur, <laughs> but it's much different this time. Oh my god! So I like this more than the Buster one. This is crazy because like <laughs> they re-recorded the Arthur theme with like a different singer. The guy doesn't sound like Ziggy Barley. He sounds completely different. Yeah. And it's like um, every day uh, when you're walking down the street, you stop and think. And it's <laughs> it's brain doing the same actions as Arthur, even with like a differently colored dog. It's like pal if he were pumpkin. Colored. Right. It's like bizarro pal. But then when he says stop and think like the episode stops. Yeah. Because he... brain's like thinking. And then like we cut to like an actual clip of an episode of brain and brains. It's, brains uh... new puppy. Right, brain soup. I forgot it's even got like a title card. Yeah, it's brain. It's brain doing the the swimming o- a title card, and it's brain's new puppy. And then I actually think this is really funny. Uh, it cuts to brain in his bedroom with his parents. He says, "Mom, Dad, I'm thinking about getting a new puppy." Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Francine ends the whole thing by saying, "That would be really interesting." I'm being sarcastic, man. It's just like. They're, they're swinging for the fences here in this episode. The hits don't stop. And so they basically, they're trying to, uh, they're misinterpreting uh, Brain's disinterest as they think he's self-conscious because he doesn't have a thing, a la that YTV advertisement. What's your thing? But I think sad effects. Here's a T-Rex. Bugs. Um, so they're trying to help uh, Brain find his thing, whether it be uh, sound effects or bugs. Uh, and they're trying to list things to Braid sort of to inspire him, all the things he's good at, like basketball, baseball, and as Buster describes, that thing with all the numbers. And Braid goes, you, you mean math? He goes, yeah. I also like it, it and Buster, Buster kind of goes like, then you, shouldn't be, uh, then you shouldn't be afraid to go on TV. And Brain says, I don't care. And then Buster's just so defeated, he's like, I've tried everything I know. <laughs> you know what? Like we, we started off this episode with answering that email about saying I don't like Muffy or Brain. Muffy and Brain both great in this these two episodes. I'm glad you brought this up because um it's much like the Arthur Goes Crosswire episode. This is an episode that is about it's a Brain episode, but it's also not really about him. It's about how everyone around him relates to him. Like, mm. it's everybody kind of playing off of him, and Brain kind of never really changes or does anything. In fact, like, his main character traits are what saves everybody in the end. So it's kind of like Brain without Brain, in a way. And I think that that's actually kind of works in its favor. Uh, Francine goes to Brain's house, and it's it, she might as well work for the creative department for the WWF in 1994. She's trying to pit, pitch him a gimmick with what, whatever just random garbage she has around. <laughs> Brain, you got to puke on TV. Here, here's the stress can. Can you puke at this stress can right now? He's going to puke. Here, here, He's going to puke. Here's some skates. You can be the goon. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just like she, she, Francine trying to pitch him different gimmicks. Like maybe he could do imitations or he could ice <laughs> skate. And then she starts to play a kazoo and says, you could be kazoo boy. And I do, and I do Which, love the next day Francine talking to Arthur and just like, he didn't even want to be Kazoo Boy. <laughs> like that was the one she had in the back pocket. Like that was that was like the Jeff Jarrett of uh, all the gimmicks she had. <laughs> Francine eventually gives up, and I did like this little thing about how, you know, Francine Francine does like literally say, "I know people," and he's really afraid to be on TV. 
<laughs> which is hilariously informing of Francine's character about how she thinks she knows people when really, mm. like, as we've seen her, she really does not know very much at all about people. I just thought that that was a really telling line. Another, hey, speaking of telling lines, uh, Muffy goes up to the camera operator and she's like trying to g- figure out which outfit to wear. And much like a millennial, she says to Mr. Ratburn, I'm just trying to project an effective media image. <laughs> That's right. Muffy would be a great influencer. Uh, speaking of this camera operator, this guy has to be modeled off a real person. Like, there's no way this wasn't like an inside <laughs> joke and they weren't actually drawing uh, the real life word from us kids camera bad. Because it's just like most Arthur uh, Arthurizations aren't this like specific. Like, they could have just made it a bunny like they usually would but this guy's got like the ponytail he's got the five o'clock shadow the glasses this has to have been based on a real person i like that term arthurization the idea of the segment is that much like the kids at the beginning of the episode who talked about gravity they're going to talk about the solar system and then everybody freezes and is like i don't know anything about the solar system so they all go to brain who of course has the has the information on lock and starts to kind of quickly educate them about it so that they can have something to say on camera. And this is where we get the the Arthur kids in the role of real life kids. So some great lines here like Binky, he's the first one on camera and he says, "The solar system is really big even compared to me." See, I this is it's essentially like a montage of the kids uh, delivering the facts that Brain gave them, but in the awkward, stilted way they would in a real-life Word From Us Kids segment. Yeah. And I just felt like this whole, like, this point, this climax of the episode was made just for me and you. Like, I, <laughs> it, it was just too perfect. I loved it. Yeah, there's even, like, when Francine does hers, it's like she starts and then she goes again. Like, the voice direction here is great, of just, like, Mars is my... Mars is my favorite planet... It's it, it's just it's such a it's such a treat. Yeah. And again, I it's I, red, which is also my uh, favorite color. Like again, some great voice direction here of they, they captured perfectly the absolute fear that some of these kids must have to be on camera. And then the proverbial cherry on this chocolate sundae of a bit is that we smash cut from Francine to them all watching a tape of the episode, and Arthur goes. We were better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good catch. So yeah, they, they they're pretty happy with how it went, but Francine's still concerned about Brain and that, you know, the poor guy will never get to be on TV. Like this was his one chance and he'll never get to be on TV again. And then we go back to the future. Once again, we we are hopping into the future uh twice in one whole episode. Uh as Brain actually is on TV, and has his own network. Professor Brain is his name. And on the Professor Brain network, we see that in the future, he perfects teleportation. He teleports a cat. A not a non-sentient cat. <laughs> oh, I, did, I didn't catch that. Oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, he's got his own television network. He's a celebrated scientist. He has a lifetime of uh, great achievements, as the thing says. And... Who's watching the Professor Brain Network but Arthur and Francine on what I assume to be the Barkazoid since it is uh, a floating couch. Here's the big question. So here's the question though, right? Yeah, I think think we're wondering. Arthur and Francine, right? Yep. So I I don't know if this is the Barkazoid yet because this Arthur and Francine would be the linear. Like this is the same Arthur and Francine that was in the, uh, the class back in the 90s. Yep. And so, God, they're elderly now. So uh, if we were in third grade in 1994. No, 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 no. Uh, Well, 1996, let's say. If you were in third grade in 1996, how old is third grade? Like Third grade is like seven. So it would be around kind of the same. Like you and I are going to be their age in like the 2070s, the 2080s. 2080. So, but the, uh, cause I had to work this out in my head. I wonder if all of this takes place in the same universe as the opening of the first episode. And so those would be the great grandchildren 
of these characters. Yeah, so you're right. It is it is them linearly. That's not actually the question I thought you were going to ask. The, oh. the real question here is, are Arthur and Francine married? Or in the future, the far flung future of 2070, has cohabitation uh, become such an accepted thing that maybe they don't have to be married? Who knows? So I don't know what culture's like in 2070. There's there's no telling. Uh, interesting also to note that in the future, it's all it's depicted as very like uh, like nature is still alive and well. Like there's all kinds of mm. animals and greenery and everything. So that's a it's a very utopian future. It seems. Oh, what's that movie called? It's like that movie with the uh, uh, the robots that plant things. Uh, Night Runners. Let me just Google Wall- this real quick. This is gonna kill me. Wally. No, not Wall. Not Wally. It's like a movie from the seventies. Oh God. Uh. Jeez. I'm going to type in robot planting space station sci-fi 70s. Let's see what let's see if this 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 helps me out. Uh, silent running 1972 ec- environmentally themed American post-apocalyptic science fiction film starring Bruce Dern and Cliff Potts. There's your homework, kids. Silent running. I don't see a ring on their fingers, so maybe they're not married. Maybe they're just still good friends. I have no idea, but it's enough to keep you guessing. Speaking of keeping you guessing, uh, Francine takes a VHS tape out of their time on the Magic Toolbox and puts it into the couch, and it goes up on the TV. What kind of re- what kind of retro BS is this? <laughs> I, the future... It all goes back to VHS tapes. The EMP destroyed all other data. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I might buy that. Uh, so it's Francine and Arthur's voice actors doing, like, their voices but older. So I uh, kind of got a kick out of that of just, like, look, there's me. That's Muffy kind of thing. <laughs> and there's a, another very telling line here that I thought was a little disturbing if you think about it. Uh, fr- uh, Francine says, and there's Buster Baxter. Whatever happened to him? And just like, <laughs> so are they not friends anymore? Like, have they? I lost think the touch? implication is. I think the implication is Buster was abducted by aliens. Oh, ooh. Uh, I, I actually half expected them to like cut away to like the alien. I, I, even though this is like four cutaways deep at this point, <laughs> it's a cutaway from like a cutaway of Braid in the future on a TV show. Uh, but I half expected them to cut away to like Buster in space, kidnapped by aliens. Also, looking at screen caps from Silent Running, the aesthetic of their future uh, uh, like habit- habitat is very much ripped from this movie. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe maybe they maybe they did get their uh, uh, inspiration from that. I guess uh, uh, that's that's left up only to them. Uh, Sh- Shadow Run, Silent Running, uh, lots of lots of influences in the in these episodes here. And the episode ends with old Arthur and old Francine uh, trying their best to sing the Magic Toolbox theme. Okay, so let's uh, let's go back here to background blues. What you think? So it's hard because I don't really. It's been a while since I watched the episode. I didn't rewatch it to be honest. I sure. uh, kind of skimmed through it sure. to make sure I had the hits from my notes and I and from my memory. I feel like I did really enjoy it. Like, besides a little bit of the clunkiness with Buffy telling on herself, I did have a lot of criticisms, and it was really entertaining. Uh, Even harrowing in some moments when I was like, is Francine really going to cut this picture? Is this what it's come to? Uh, But I thought the characterization of Buffy was some of the best I've ever seen. Uh, And I thought all the jokes really hit. Wolf Blitzen. Uh, (laughs) um, uh, Just, like, a really fun episode. Um, yeah, it's, it, I know that's a lot of times we've been kind of down on the ensemble episodes because they haven't really, uh, delivered in the ways that we wanted it to. I thought this was... It's more so just a Buffy and Francine episode, though. We don't get a lot of art, like, besides Buster's lunchbox, uh, which I sort of made more of a subplot in my head, uh, we don't really get a lot of the other characters. Right. Um, I, I did, I did enjoy it. I thought it was, uh... Both of these episodes very very dense with like a lot of stuff going on in them, and I say dense in a in a in a posi- in a positive way because there's like a lot to pay attention to. There's a lot of uh, funny lines. There's a lot of 
uh, just kind of stuff to keep you very interested in the episode. And I did like this mm. idea of them tracing their history. It makes the characters feel a little bit more real. Like they've got, you know, grand grandparents and great grandparents who have been part of Elwood City for a long time. And it just kind of fe- makes the world feel a little bit more lived in. I also like the subversion of expectations with Muffy's family tree. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I like you, Lucas, always love a little bit of future humor. So I, I really <laughs> like the framing device of this, too. In a similar way, I thought that And Now Let's Talk to Some Kids was also... Uh, I, I, I definitely think that that's my favorite of the two. Just because of... I, I don't want to overuse the word meta, but just of how... Um, and insular is not the word I want to use either. Self-referential. Yeah. The episode was. It was very willing to uh, kind of poke fun at itself and to uh, kind of turn this on, on your head. I remember watching – I kind of remember watching this as a kid and just being kind of blown away. Again, like this might have been one of my first uh, exposures to like meta humor and meta fiction. And I believe I've said that before about Arthur. It's definitely an interesting way to – to introduce these concepts to young viewers. Yeah, like the closest thing I could see in other like kid shows is like the Krusty Krab training video episode of SpongeBob. Yeah, Club. yeah, that's a good that's a good one. And I do like that episode too. Uh, but Oh, for a while that was my favorite episode of SpongeBob. What is it now? Oh jeez, I I I I don't quite remember. I think as I've gotten older, like the Krusty Krab training video is a little too low random for my taste. Okay. Um but as a kid I really loved it. It could be the lost episode. The lost episode is a very good episode of SpongeBob. Also very meta. Sounds like a load of hoopla, hoopla. <laughs> my favorite. My favorite episode is the one where Squidward eats a Krabby Patty for the first time. That Ooh, that's, that's good like one, one of the funniest things. One of the funniest episodes of any television show I've ever seen. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, yeah, and I. I just kind of liked how, again, this was kind of about a character, but not directly involving the character in term in terms of being brain. And it was very interesting to see how people reacted to just him being the way he is. Uh, and I thought that that was also very interesting and like kept my attention and had a lot of great lines, made me think a lot about the universe because of the, you know, the ending sequence there with Arthur and Francine. And yeah, I would def I definitely really enjoyed this one. For me personally, it's like, I don't know how unbiased I could be towards this episode because I feel like it was so specific. Like, for the purposes of this podcast, this episode is so, like, I got so much from it that I don't know if someone who was just, like, turning on the TV and watching it, a random Arthur episode would get. But, like, they answered, like, the question, like, do... Uh, do the camera crews just go to people who work on the TV show's kid's house? No! It turns out it's random schools, apparently, that get selected, if, if this episode's to be believed. The fact that they made a new opening with Brain, a shot-for-shot remake of the Arthur opening, twice, kind of, with the Buster one as well. I'm, I'm almost speechless with how much I enjoyed and how much I got out of this episode. Now, take that with a grain of salt, because... We have the uh, special perspective of watching every single Arthur episode that's come before it, so we kind of get something a little bit extra from it. But I had a blast watching this. Yeah, it could be with the subtitle, A Love Letter to Elwood City Limits, just uh, kind of into the future. But hey, maybe they maybe they had, uh, clearly they've got some link to the future as well. Maybe they knew that we would do this some 20 years later and uh, just put this in here just for us. You never know. You can't prove that they didn't do that. <laughs> All right, that is uh, the first Elwood City Limits episode of 2018. It's in the books as we move along through season three. Uh, this actually might be a little bit difficult for me. I, it's been a long time. It's been a couple of weeks since I have uh, given us the rundown for where you can find us online. So uh, uh, here we go. I'll do my best. We are available on the uh, social media websites, Facebook, facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. Give us a like over there. We've gotten some Excellent five-star reviews, and thank you very much for everybody who has. You can follow us on Twitter at ECL Podcast or on Tumblr, elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com. Thank you uh, for the Tumblr asks. We've gotten some good ones uh, recently. Keep them coming. I uh, definitely get a little bit rush of endorphins here. Oh, by the way, I should note that uh, an anonymous American listener 
uh, answered a question that we had in the last episode. So remember we were talking about how in the Wilbur Rabbit Club or whatever it was, uh, we were wondering what kind of they were aping because they said, like, we the people. And we were like, is that the Constitution? Is that the Pledge of Allegiance? What is that? Uh... So we the people is from the U.S. Constitution and with liberty and justice for all is from the, pre- is from the Pledge of Allegiance. I see. So you're both right in a way. Yeah. I thought you were going to just say that the American listener was like, well, it's from Jack Swagger's entrance. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hey I can't I can't prove that they weren't thinking that so that's what I'm gonna believe. Uh, you can also email us just like our wonderful listeners did uh, many weeks ago. Thanks for being patient with us, Elwood City Limits at Gmail dot com. Finally, if you'd like to listen to the show, we are on uh, iTunes uh, or I should say Apple Podcasts. Uh, please give us a rating and review over there if you haven't already. We really appreciate it. Uh, you can find us on the Google Play Store, and you can find all of our episodes at elwoodcitylimits.libsyn.com, L-I-B-S-Y-N. Uh, Lucas, we continue on with the uh, episodes of interest in Season 3. I wonder if this will inspire any memories in you. This one, it's another one where both of the stories are related to each other. Uh, next time on Elwood City Limits, it's The Chips Are Down and Revenge of the Chip. Oh my good! Uh, this is an episode I the I thought this was in season one. So color me excited, no pun intended, for uh, next week. We've got so, we've got some great uh, DW uh, coming up in this. We've got some great Binky. It's gonna be like, it's, it's gonna be an all star jamboree. So I can't wait for you to join us for this. I can't wait to watch it and talk about it. Elwood City Limits is back for 2018. Thanks a lot for joining us. Hope you've got a great year ahead of you as well. My name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini, he didn't even want to be Kazoo Boy. That's Elwood City Limits. Happy New Year, everybody. We'll see you next time.